Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, unfortunately for everyone, I think I may need to apologize because they've given me more time to talk to you than, uh, than original, so I love taking that opportunity. So yeah, hopefully everyone's ready for the ride that, uh, that we're going to go on. Uh, I want to say that this is a topic near and dear to me. I've uh, been working for over 15 years, obviously, in geriatric rehab, and uh, throughout the years, I have seen more and more patients on more and more medications, and, and you start to really wonder what, you know, what's going on, how is this affecting everyone? And the more and more people I've even talked to, even today at the deprescribing booth, uh, you hear more and more stories, and uh, it really is some problems that we're hoping to address little by little in the hopes of engaging everyone here. So before we start, I want to uh, obviously thank all of our sponsors as well. Hopefully you got the chance to see our uh, 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 collaborators, the Canadian Deprescribing Network Group that helped with a lot of this uh, presentation uh, and as well our, our close uh, collaborators with us from the Montreal Group uh, in order to be able to get the message out. When I uh, first was talking with Robert and Helen, who were the organizers of this, uh, this agenda, they had mentioned to me that uh, you know, they had seen talks before and one of their big things were, is do you have a story? And, uh, and funny enough, you know, I, I think all of us have a story. I've heard them today from many people where it's not just maybe necessarily yourself that's on a lot of medications, but maybe a loved one, uh, maybe someone that you know down the street, uh, maybe someone that uh, you know you've talked to on the bus. Uh, and, and it's really scary to see that, uh, you know, we are always concerned about those people, but don't really know what to do about it. Uh, when we actually did a deprescribing uh, symposium uh, that was internationally based at the end of March, uh, we tried to really not only engage healthcare providers into this initiative, but really looking at it from a patient's perspective. And uh, one thing that really got us was that we had a, um, a wonderful lady, Joanna Trimble, uh, come and give her story to us about her mother. And uh, she actually shared a video with us that she posted on YouTube that I thought maybe might be a good one to share with you as well. The other morning I was making breakfast for mom. She lives with me, I look after her. And I was just, you know, cutting up some grapefruit, making some toast. And the other part of the meal is standard to a lot of older people, a bowl of pills, all the prescriptions she's on. So when I served it to her, it seemed ridiculous to me. And I just thought, these pills are making her feel worse rather than better. I was tired of just looking at them and doing nothing. I found this really great website called MedStopper that was put together by some researchers from the University of British Columbia. One by one, I started entering all of mom's medications <coughs> into the website. Thank you. into the medication website, I could see that there were a number of them that were a problem for my mom. I phoned the doctor and asked for a longer appointment so we could review all those medications. Yes, um, I'm wondering if we could get an appointment um, to talk to the doctor. There are some medications that we think are a problem and we'll need a longer appointment to go through. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, actually, yes, one of the problems is some dizziness. She's having some recurring dizziness. Uh, no, we don't want another prescription. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next Thursday, one o'clock. All right, bye-bye. Can you help. believe it? <laughs> Is your mom on too many drugs? It's a question you need to ask. You can ask your doctor to review medications. Your loved one has a right to a good quality of life and the doctor's there to help you. So you can see that the take home messages are multiple from that perspective. And when this talk was supposed to be about taking charge of your health, I think what I really want everyone to know is that 
everything is a two-way street. It's not just your doctor that's involved and in charge of everything. You too can take a role in be either being an advocate for your, your loved one or, your, or the one you're caring for, or even for yourself. Because even though you may not be on medications of uh, you know, any concern at this point, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you wanna make sure that you're preventing the problem in the future. So being well prepared, well educated about your medications is really one step in the right direction for everyone. So I'm not here to tell you that all medications are bad, so I'm not hoping everyone's gonna go out and stop all of the medications and, and go from there, because there are opportunities to actually improve your quality of life and improve your medical conditions with those medications that are out there. So they do have reasons for them. What we're trying to focus on in the fact is that there are some medications that may have been started for a good reason, but the evidence as you get older and uh, as you're started on more and more medications may not necessarily be there anymore. So some of the evidence is really staggering. There's a lot of statistics out there and when you look on, you know, the question, are seniors on too many medications? You probably would say yes. Uh, when you say two out of every three Canadians over 65 is on at least five different prescription medications, and then one out of every four is at on least 10, uh, you really start to wonder how are they working, what's going on, uh, you know, are they really that effective and are they doing more harm than good? So there's a big word out there in the medical community called polypharmacy. So when you hear that word, it means that you may be taking more medications than you need to, or which those medications maybe have more harm than they do benefit. So it's not always about number, because if you're on one medication and it's not doing you any good, then that's still polypharmacy too. So it, sometimes it's not really just about numbers. It's about how are they working in you and how are they making you feel. So as we get older, it seems like a pretty complicated slide, but I uh, watched a, a little uh, video from one of the physicians, uh, Dr. D. Morgan, and she had a great way of analyzing it. If you think about music, when you hear music one song at a time, or if you take medications one at a time, you know, they sound pretty good. They make sense to you. You know, the Beatles uh, sounds great, and, and you know, Bill Co uh, Bing Crosby sounds great. When you m play all of them all together, if you put all five songs together, they start to make a lot of noise and they don't really make sense anymore. As we get older on top of that, your body becomes kind of like a remote control stuck on high volume. And so those medications in your system really start increasing and they may then at that point make your ears hurt, make your head hurt because the, the, the noise is too loud. Uh, and at that point, they may be doing you more harm than good. And, uh, and the same idea too is just because you loved a song when you were five years old, doesn't mean that you really love that song the same way you do when you're, you're 65 or 75. So who's at most risk? So they've really looked at the fact that people with multiple um, medical conditions uh, tend to be at risk of getting a lot of medications. And that because, that's because a lot of the times guidelines say that if you have heart disease, if you have diabetes, if you've had a heart attack, uh, at that point you could be up to six or seven medications if you're following those guidelines. Uh, people over the age of 65, because obviously you tend to be more sick when you are older. Uh, and then unfortunately the big scary part about it is the fact that if these medications are being taken, and if you're taking them and they're not working for you or causing harm, hospitalizations tend to be a big, big thing as far as what those risks are to you and why we're that concerned. Um, so you can see that one in 200 seniors are hospitalized due to harmful effects from medications. Uh, and then seniors are also hospitalized five times more often than people under the age of 65. So when you're looking at uh, you know, the healthcare costs in general, your quality of life going back and forth to the emergency rooms, getting added more medications sometimes at that point too to kind of counteract a side effect can really be impactful. So how can it affect you? You can see here on the side, it's something called a prescribing web. And what we found is that sometimes a medication is started, you may have a side effect for it. And instead of actually getting rid of the medication, you actually add another medication onto it to help with the side effect, 
without really knowing it. And so that process then can keep continuing on and on and on. And when you've started with one medication, you can suddenly end up with 10. Sometimes we find that there's a lot more drug interactions. So in your body, one is fighting against another. Uh, you can find that a lot of the times patients or, or people in homes find that they're, they're so complicated with their pill regimens, they don't take them the way they're supposed to or get confused. Um, everyone says, oh, blister packs are, are the way to go. So that's the weekly packaging to kind of organize your life. Um, but in so many cases, I've seen some of my older patients come in and their, their packages, you know, only have two or three of their, their, their bubbles taken. So there's always that, that risk. Uh, and on top of that, hip fractures, falls, confusion tend to be another thing that we're always worried about the more and more medications that you're on. So the risk of drug interactions, obviously it's, it gets older. So there's that, uh, there's that music again. So a, a low risk is when you're only listening to two songs, but then suddenly as you get to eight, 10 songs, you can just imagine what kind of noise you're gonna be hearing in your head. Um, and inappropriate medications. So we talked about the fact that the, the minute you start throwing in medications that actually shouldn't be used as you get older, then that can even increase your risk of how, uh, you, how you're going to be feeling and how those are going to make you, uh, make you feel at home. And it, we found that uh, over 65 and over 85, the numbers are really staggering as far as how many patients, you know, like almost half, half of the people are, are taking medications they probably shouldn't be. So what can be done? So obviously it sounds very, you know, oh my goodness, well, if this, if this is such a big problem, you know, we can't do anything about it. Um, and I don't think that's the case. So our group and, and our initiatives have been trying to really look at the fact that deprescribing is possible. And what that is, is reducing or stopping medications that it could be causing harm or no longer having any benefit. Uh, and the goal is to really, um, you know, reduce the medication burden, so how many numbers of pills you're on, uh, while still keeping your quality of life. So it's that finding that balance between the risks and the benefits based on what your goals are at that time. And we're really start, uh, trying to change culture. It, it's really that attitude, both from the healthcare providers or your, your family doctors or your pharmacists, and from your perspective when you're walking into that office. So changing that attitude of the fact that deprescribing is part of good prescribing. And the questions I should be asking you is not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you. It is a supervised process. So we wanna say that this should be done together. We're in the same, uh, you know, we all want to help each other. And so as a, as a pharmacist, as your family doctor, uh, we want to make sure that the process is done properly. So that way you're also not going to have any effects um, while you're, you're reducing your medications or trying to come off of them um, because you never know. So you want to make sure that it's done properly uh, and that you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page so that there, there's information that you've got is the same that the information that the pharmacist has and the same information that the family doctor or specialists have as well. So you can see here the little picture. So as we talked about, there's the, there's the benefits. So obviously making sure that uh, you know we're treating the condition that you have and making sure that we, we don't have any problems with it. But then at the same time, there's also those risks that kind of start getting a little heavier as we get older. Uh, and as we become more frail. So, you know, things like the, uh, the fact that there's the uh, medication changes related as you get older, that your body doesn't process them the same, uh, and that we know that there's more and more adverse side effects with medications the more you add on to them. So our deprescribing research group that, I, uh, that I've been involved with since uh, December, so I'm a, a little bit of a newbie at this, but, uh, but they've, they've done some really great research over the last uh, two to three years. And Dr. Barb Farrell really um, started it based on her work because a lot of the time she tried to engage doctors and patients into tapering medications and getting rid of things that she felt weren't, uh, weren't necessary, but she'd get a lot of pushback 
And half of it is because of the fact that as uh, healthcare providers, we always want evidence. We want to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the right time. And there really wasn't a lot of evidence out there to encourage patients or healthcare providers to do it. Um, so what we tried to do, as you can see out in our booth, if you hopefully got the chance to visit, is that we've come up with algorithms or safe ways of being able to s assess certain medication uh, groups and making sure that you are, at that point in your life, an appropriate uh, person to think about trying to taper or reduce a medication safely and how to do it. The other things that we're trying to do is also kind of educate everyone. So networking with people like you, trying to get the message out. Half of the time, uh, I hear it from both sides when I do these talks. Uh, doctors will say, well, you know, deprescribing is great, but every time I talk to my patients, they look at me like I've got three eyes and saying, well, you know, what do you mean you're not going to give me a prescription when, I, when I'm telling you there's something wrong with me? Uh, and on the other hand, I also hear it from, from patients and, and clients where they're saying that I've tried talking to my doctor and they just kind of fluff me off and, and they, don't, uh, they don't take me seriously. So we've been finding that our education efforts and our, our spreading the word needs to happen across uh, the continuum and, uh, and needs to happen you know, with everyone involved. So I did want to bring this one out. So benzodiazepines or sleep <coughs> medications. Uh, you can see that this ad was in the late 1970s. So those medications have been around forever. And from this ad, it looks like you might as well have put it in the water because it's the best thing since, uh, you know, fried chicken. Uh, <laughs> to our chagrin now, we've, uh, we've learned more and more about the fact that this type of medication uh, can increase, you know, your risk for falling, can fog up your mind, uh, can affect your balance. Uh, and so we're learning more and more about the fact that these side effects can really affect people uh, in different ways. And so when, when family doctors say that patients don't want to stop their sleep medications because they're worried about not sleeping, uh, I always encourage them to find out what motivates. So, uh, you know, one of the motivating factors in Denmark when they looked at benzodiazepines was the fact that they realized it affects how you drive. And so for any senior that was prescribed a benzodiazepine in Denmark, they took away their driver's license. So, uh, so you can just see how the extent of that, you know, may not have happened here in Canada, but I think when you, uh, when you look at it from, if it's going to affect your driving, how comfortable do you feel with your grandson in the back seat, knowing that, there might I that it might increase your risk of not being able to react in, a, in an emergency situation? And so, it, you know, it's, it's little things like that, finding out what, uh, you know, what's important to that person to say, okay, maybe it's not right for you today, but given these risks, could we maybe think about it in the future? And, uh, you know, and getting that conversation started. Or if even for yourself, where you're just like, oh my gosh, I never knew about that kind of an effect, maybe it is time for me to think about it. So you'll notice that some of our information pamphlets at the booth really try to focus on in, uh, you know, giving you the information about what those medications are about, why you, know, you may have been introduced to them, what kind of things they do, uh, and why you really want to try to safely reduce them uh, based on their side effects. And part of you know, being involved with your own healthy changes is on the back of those sheets, we also encourage you to take part. So there's always homework when you're reducing medications because of the fact that it's so much easier to take a pill than it is to actually think about changing your lifestyle and taking charge of the fact that you can make little changes in your lifestyle that will eventually help make sure that you don't need those medications anymore. So we're always engaging you as, as the, the person taking that medication to take charge of your, your own life as well and uh, try to figure out if there's other ways we can combat uh, why you're having those kinds of symptoms. So it's, it's, uh, it's a two-way street. So what can you do? So educate yourself about your medications. A lot of people have come up to me today and said, oh, you know, I'm not on any medications right now, and that's phenomenal. But at some point or another, if you are prescribed a medication, then I think it's important for you to know that you need to make sure you know what you're taking it for, what the long-term plan is, when are we going to reassess those things, 
because right now it might be good for me, but in five or 10 years where I'm not feeling like this is important in, to me anymore, can we maybe think about stopping it? Uh, you know, so, so making sure that you have that information. I always find that it's very difficult to de-prescribe a medication if we have no idea why it got started in the first place. So that information when someone asks you, so I'm, I'm always asking the dumb questions is, okay, when did it get started and, and why did it get started? I get a lot of I don't knows. So it's very hard to say, oh, well, it's okay to de-prescribe it if the, question, if the answer is I don't know. <coughs> Engage in the discussion with your, your healthcare provider. So when you're going in for a symptom, don't be surprised when he says, well, I might not want to prescribe you a medication for that right now. Are you open to trying other alternatives, whether it's exercising, changing your diet, uh, you know, looking at, uh, at other ways of doing it? So be open to that because I know it requires a little bit more work, but in the end, it actually may prevent you from having to go on medications to begin with. Spread the word. So this is part of it is that you are, are a great audience, you've been here, but I'm hoping that you can go out and, and, and you know, to your community partners, if you have different groups out there and say, listen, did you ever hear about this? Or if you've got a neighbor, hey, listen, I've picked up this information pamphlet for you because I think it might be good for you to think about. Uh, it's the little things. We're hoping that this snowball that's at the top of the mountain right now that's pretty small will hopefully turn into an avalanche and that in hopefully five or, you know, two or five years kind of thing, I'm out of a job because this isn't a problem anymore. Um, and be prepared and aware throughout your de-prescribing plan. So consistency in your message to all of your healthcare providers will make sure that this problem doesn't happen in the future. Uh, one story from uh, a physician was, you know, I worked so hard with this one patient and her daughter about the fact that she was dizzy and her cardiologist had recommended a blood pressure medication and so we stopped it. Um, and then three months later, they went back to their, their cardiologist and he started the prescription all over again. So it, it's, it's really frustrating to see that kind of thing happen. And part of it is because of the fact that you need to make sure that you're aware of the plan and that you're communicating that plan as best as you can for, all, for everyone. So that way it uh, you know, hopefully prevents it too. And lastly but not least, ask your questions. Stay informed be proactive and participate in, in making your smart choices. Ultimately, you're the one taking those medications. So I think you have the right to be able to ask questions and know what's going on. Helpful links. So uh, you're gonna notice that the Canadian Deprescribing Network has quite a few uh, information pamphlets. You can also grab those from our website as well. So that five questions to ask your, your, uh, your healthcare provider about your medications is a really great one, um, especially when medications are getting started. So when that pharmacist is taking that five minutes to talk to you about a new medication or your doctor is starting to write something out, these questions should be in the, uh, you know, in your mind and, and get, a, you know, get answered kind of thing and, and write them down. Uh, I always tell my mother-in-law, uh, I can't remember what I ate for lunch, so how can you remember all of this information two minutes later? Bring a pen and a paper, write it down, make sure you've got it accessible and, and bring it with you to all of those appointments or anything that you're going to. MedStopper, so you saw how Joanna used that. Uh, you know, it's a great website to kind of see what kind of medications am I on, are there any interactions of concern that I should be worried about or, or bringing forward to my family doctor. Uh, sometimes we end up taking medications over the counter that we don't think are important or, or that they're herbal. You'd be surprised at how many effects or interactions can happen with those two. Um, so it's not just the prescription ones when someone says what pills are you taking that are important It's all of them and they and you know, it's important to know when do I take it how often uh, and uh, you know How does it make me feel? And last but not least there are uh, obviously multiple sources of, of resources that you can always access so even if you didn't get a chance to see our booth today uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to go in. You can access all of those information pamphlets uh, for free uh, and you can print them off at your leisure, uh, you know, hand them out to your friends and family. Uh, so the deprescribing guidelines is ourselves, uh, the Canadian Deprescribing Network. 
Uh, Choosing Wisely Canada is also another national organization that is trying to encourage patients and healthcare providers to not do things when there is no evidence of benefit, so things like x-rays, um, you know, pain medications and, and sleep medications. Uh, and then ISMP, or, or Safe Medication Practices Canada, is the one that has the five questions that they've come out with. So really, that's, uh, that's it for the presentation part of it but I'm uh, more than happy to entertain any questions or, or conversations or anything like that that someone might have. Can you go back to the last slide? Can Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, at, uh, when, when I see some of the, uh, the younger generation, all of them were taking pictures of all the slides <laughs> on their phones. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I've got a pen and paper. <laughs> yes. You were talking about benzodiazepines and the uh, after effects. How long will those after effects last if you've taken it uh, for one night? Uh, are we talking? It'll last forever, or weeks, days? So it really depends on which benzodiazepine because of some of them, they, it, it's called what a half-life or, or the, the, life, the life in your body. Um, so that will depend on, on that as well. It also depends on your age. So as we, we find that as we age as well, because our body doesn't process and get rid of the medication as quickly as it might have when we were younger, that can actually extend the life and duration of that too. So it could be it could be twelve you know it could be three hours it could be twelve it could be twenty four so it really does depend on which one. But it's not months, right? No, not months. But what we do find as well too is that um, sometimes the effects people will say, oh well, I only take them once in a while. But it's funny, uh, you know, that sometimes it still increases your risk because of the fact that you're introducing something that your body's not always used to. So it's kind of like alcohol, right? You know, when you when you drink one glass a day, it doesn't really affect you as much as, oh my gosh, I've gone out and, and binge drink and, and suddenly the next day I'm paying for it. So it, it really does depend for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of things I wanted to ask. Um, Do we have a does your organization... Does that, or are your organization, for instance, advocate against government enforcing regulations? Oh, okay. <laughs> government <laughs> enforcing regulations? Uh, and, and I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. I've noticed lately it's getting very common again for doctors to go to symposiums in the Bermuda by drug companies that are sponsoring them. And that was for a while frowned upon. And now it's become very common again. So they, they prescribe certain medications based on the fact that I'm going on a nice holiday soon. And you can That's see that one. no one's, no, no drug company is sponsoring our talk today. <laughs> okay. Then number two, then number two, uh, another thing, uh, 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 my background is a scientist, by the way, so. Um, and then number two is nowadays we have problems with kids getting into these drugs. And uh, so as a grandparent or whatever, uh, by not having these drugs in the household, if you don't need them and storing them up, because even getting rid of them can be a problem, because I've had to do a number of estates recently, um, you know, that, that should be encouraged and that should be brought up too with de-prescribing. And I think that's, that's just it. it, knowing what community partners you have out there. So I guess with the first question, you're absolutely right. The one thing from our symposium at the end of March that we, we did find is that this problem is so complicated and complex and has so many um, people involved. Uh, it's really hard to just choose one group and say, if we focus only on physicians, this problem is going to go away. It's not. It really does need to come from everyone. So part of it is, you know, how do we encourage it in our education system with our pharmacists and, and young physicians? How do we encourage to make sure that when guidelines come out and say that, you know, you have a medical condition and you need to start these medications, that thou must also include the fact that this is the time when you need to think about getting rid of them. 
Uh, and so, and looking at, uh, you know, different even insurance companies as well, instead of paying for medications, should we, or, or paying to dispense medications, should we be not paying our, our healthcare providers to spend the time to sit down and review medications with everyone where, yes, it does take some time, but the ultimate the ultimate endpoint is is obviously making sure that your your you know, people that you're you're taking care of are, are feeling better, and avoiding that. Um, so that that definitely is part of it. So we're we're trying a little bit of everything. Uh, choosing YZ Canada and the Canadian Deprescribing Network are are really our partners as far as trying to get the the dissemination and the word out nationwide and and looking at advocating with those kinds of groups. Uh, and then as far as your second part, hopefully I've answered the first part okay, uh, is the fact that yes, I think knowing what kind of community partners you have out there, uh, it doesn't necessarily just need to be your physician, but your pharmacist and, and taking the opportunity to make an appointment even with them as far as what can I do at home. They do home visits. Uh, they will accept, you know, old medications. So, you know, you're always encouraged to make sure that whatever you have at home is exactly what you're taking. Don't, you know, don't save it for a rainy day because you never know, you know, and uh, and things like that too. Pamela. Yes. I'm Hi. over here. Yeah, Chris Ford. I, the point that I wanted to make, you've actually just uh, mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, and that is there's no big pharma that's sponsoring this presentation. Uh, <laughs> Duh, I mean, that kind of figures. Uh, but are any efforts being made with the big pharmaceuticals to, to bring them on site, to at least enter into the conversation, uh, to be more proactive in terms of, of deprescribing medications when they conflict with one another and so forth? Because surely that's an important piece of the, of, of the puzzle. And I, d I don't know... It I owe Jenny may have stepped out, but I, like I said, our group is a little bit more on the. Uh, it's it's uh, a little bit of a smaller group, so but uh, so we haven't officially gone out there, but that's why we've kind of partnered with a lot of these other bigger organizations okay. in the hope that yes, we will be able to kind of, um, not necessarily stronghold everyone into thinking this way, but uh, but definitely changing the culture. Uh, mm -hmm. And changing the fact that uh, it, you know, it's not just medications are, are always great, but that sometimes medications do need to change as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's definitely going to take time. I, it's taken this long to get to this point, um, okay. and it's probably going to take just as long or longer. But I think it needs to come from everyone. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. You mentioned over-the-counter drugs, and I assume you're basically talking about a prescription drugs. But I wonder about vitamins, because you didn't mention them, because we all know we're given vitamins for our bones and vitamins for this yeah. and that and the other yeah. thing. Is this part of the equation? Absolutely. Everyone always says, oh, well, you know, it's, it's over the counter or it's a vitamin or anything like that. Everything has a role to play. If it's going in your mouth, it's affecting your body. And, I, and, and really, maybe some things are safe and that, that's great, but there's no reason why you should withhold that information. Uh, you know, so so don't take it for granted, uh, and and there you know you want the people taking care of you to have the right information. So I, I don't you know I, I don't believe that you should be keeping secrets of any sort, whether it's the fact that no I am not taking this medication um, because because of A B and C or being forthcoming with the fact that you know what I, I only take half of it because it really makes me feel funny, um, because it's amazing how many times. Uh, your family doctor or your specialist may think that you've been taking this medication at this dose for this long, but your blood pressure is still up, so I'm actually going to give you another medication because obviously the first one didn't work. So now suddenly instead of taking one, you're now given two, and you may actually have only needed half of one. And, uh, and so it just does perpetuate the problem. So don't keep secrets. Tell them everything. El is it on? Is it on? Okay, Elder Ryan. The Ministry of Health has recently come out with a directive, and I don't know the details, but it is where they've requested that pharmacies are uh, uh, supplying uh, facilities like long-term care and others, that there has to be transparency, yep. and it's identified whether they went to Bermuda or went to Canada. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to, two tips that have helped me and saved me is know your pharmacy. 
and have a relationship between them that they know and it's flagged that you have allergies. So when there's slip-ups made by on a prescription, it has saved me twice in that the pharmacy was able to say, uh-oh, there's something not right here, wouldn't fill it, and we had to go back and get clarification. The other thing is, if you want a quick information on diseases or s symptoms, go to the Mayo Clinic. It is fabulous. A, B, A to Z, punch in what you want to uh, find out about and have fun. Will it help the deprescribing function to offer natural alternatives? I'm sorry, offer? Natural alternatives. Okay. So here's my thing on natural alternatives. I, I truly believe that, uh, you know, any, anything that's going in your mouth that is going to be affecting your system is still a medication. I don't, you know, it, it, digoxin, warfarin, those are all natural when you f think about where they came from. Just because now they're being manufactured, it does not mean that they did not start somewhere. So I think everyone also needs to be aware of the fact that they are still medications and that you're still purchasing them. There's still a cost, there's still a benefit, you know. So, uh, you know, as, as good as everyone may think that natural medicines are because of the fact that they're natural, uh, you still need to be wary of the fact that they still have side effects, they still have interactions, that you still need to be wary of them. And you need to make sure that, yes, if you're taking them, let someone know, okay? Hi, it's uh, me again. I already outed myself as a retired physician, so I felt I should, I had three quick comments. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Extremely important topic. I have seen a real push, especially in Ontario, that pharmacy and pharmacists are getting more and more roles and responsibilities. And it's pretty standard at all the main pharmacies now, shoppers for sure, that you can call and say, I'd like an appointment for a medication review. And it's only your pharmacist that has databases on everything, all the over-the-counters, the holistics. You can tell them and come in with your family member or yourself, have that free, usually, appointment to review all your medications for interactions with each other. So I'd really encourage you to go to sort of the expert for the medication interactions and take advantage of that opportunity with your pharmacist. Uh, there was also a few comments about family doctors and uh, our time and our ability to do this. Again, we tend to not be experts in the interaction of all the different drugs. We're relying on your pharmacist to screen for that interaction. And if people are concerned and still wanting their family doctor to do these medication reviews, I, I would be remiss in not commenting. We're sitting here in Ontario. I'm gonna assume most of us not all, but are from Ontario and we have a provincial election coming up. And all of the uh, limitations of your family doctor are usually very directly related to how we are getting paid and the limitations that are put on us from government. So now is your time to get educated in this area. If you want your family doctor to be able to spend more time with you, we need a different payment and remuneration focus. And now in this next month is the time to come to all the town halls, ask your healthcare related questions, demand that we actually have a system that works better for your patients in our Ontario healthcare system. We have it this month is the time to get involved with that. And third, as a physician who has uh, 30 years as a physician, 10 years in Ottawa, I personally have not ever seen or experienced any pharmaceutical company inviting me to go anywhere for in Bermuda. So whoever knows how I can get to Bermuda for free, <laughs> I would love to know me how to too. do that. <laughs> It's way too cold in Ottawa. <laughs> Hello, I saw on TV, an American station not very long ago, that there's a National Bring Back Medication Day or something. I don't know what the real title is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that makes a lot of sense. And they said they brought back on one day 900,000 pounds of medication, you know, unused, they're hanging around. I said, well, 900,000 pounds, that's like a huge amount of uh, medication, a little pill, you know. So, I mean, maybe eventually that would be, I know it won't change this, but it is part of it. It could be part of it to get rid of that. The other thing I would like to mention too, if you watch American news, CNN, the news like that, all the medication, I mean, I, I feel quite sick after I don't, I, I, I mean, 
because I only take one or two or whatever. And, but I mean, you need this for your heart, and if you got this, I mean, hell, I mean, it might be useful, wouldn't it? Eh? So I mean, it just is like watch McDonald or go get this stuff, you know. So it's, I think this I, this year is very interesting. It's, I thank you very much for this presentation. And I think that's just it. It's 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 mitigating expectations uh, from from both perspectives. It's uh, you know not getting uh, not getting upset when you go into the office and and not given a prescription. Uh, you know, it's it's making sure that uh, that you take involvement when uh, when there are alternatives uh, to prescription medications, uh, even though it may require a bit more work on your part or or things like that. Uh, and like I said, keeping yourselves informed. Uh, both sides, uh, you know, I, there's such a passion out there in the community from both sides of it. Whether it's a f you know the family doctors that I've done talks with, whether it's the pharmacists. It's all in our scope of practice, and, and we are aware of the problem, and we want to try to help. It's just a matter of, you know, there's all these barriers sometimes or these misconceptions. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not that uh, that you should be wary of it. I think we all need to kind of keep moving forward, and it's the little things. So if it doesn't work in that first uh, first little try, well, then, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll kind of push through it because there may be little blips in the... Uh, in reducing your medications or trying to stop things, but it doesn't mean that you can't keep trying. Okay. Over here. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, at the beginning, there, you, um, my qu comment is to what of certain uh, foods. You showed a video and you opened with uh, pills Fruit? and grapefruit. <laughs> and you did not expand, but I've heard that grapefruit interacts badly with, um, with certain pills. And uh, are there other foods or food groups that in may or could interact mm -hmm. negatively with? Uh, so, so sometimes those kinds of dietary restrictions may not necessarily be, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you've just taken it once, kind of thing. So, y yes, it is quite funny that grapefruit was there. Obviously, hopefully, that wasn't a problem with her medications. Um, but I think oh, sometimes uh, those interactions can happen when you actually take your medications with food or certain foods, where it might diminish. Uh, how effective it is. Uh, so there's always little things like that where some medications you have to take it on an empty stomach to be able to get the best benefit from it, uh, you know. And and so you do need to be aware of those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. A lot of the times there's so many to list. It's really um, important maybe when you are with your pharmacist and you're reviewing your medications at the meds check, uh, you know, to kind of make sure that you're aware of those things or when things are started. It, grapefruit is a big one. There really isn't one I can think of that's, oh my gosh, with all, it, and grapefruit's even with only a few. So it's not even with everything. You know, I, I know now everyone seems like they, they should avoid grapefruit no matter what the case is. Uh, I know in our hospital we just avoid it altogether, so that way there isn't a concern. Um, but it's not with everything. Uh, so it, that's why I'm saying I, I don't want someone to limit what they're eating from, from uh, you know, just because they're on certain medications. Uh, one poor lady was on warfarin therapy, so that's a blood thinner, and that actually has some kind of dietary restrictions sometimes because it can affect your levels. Um, so the poor woman actually avoided all leafy green vegetables, salads, and everything because that's what she had the impression she had to do. And that, unfortunately, is not necessarily the case. It's more looking at the fact that it just needs to be in moderation, and that you know, you you know, if you're not overdoing it, then then life should be fine. So. It, you know, it's really hard for me to say, hey, don't don't eat everything kind of thing. It, it really is specific for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being a patient and engaged audience. <laughs> <laughs>